and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Twee Vu. On our program, the Warriors' record-setting season and a look ahead to the playoffs. Plus, our reporters' roundtable looks at disparities and reforms in two major Bay Area law enforcement agencies. But first, we all do it, stare at screens. There are TVs, tablets, computers, and those ubiquitous smartphones. Young people seem increasingly addicted to them, and that has parents struggling over how to best monitor and even limit their children's screen time. How worried should parents be? And what does scientific research say about the effects of excessive screen time on brain development? That's what Dr. Delaney Rustin set out to learn with her new documentary, Screenagers. Here's a clip. The young adolescent brain can oscillate back and forth very, very quickly, but it comes at a cost. I'm so distracted by my phone, so it's hard to listen to a teacher and actually understand what they're saying. What's extraordinary about the studies on multitasking is even though you're doing worse and worse on everything you're doing, you feel as though you're doing better and better. Who's there to catch you at home? Your mom? You can outsmart her easily. No, no offense. Yeah, mom, it's really hard math thing. And joining me now is filmmaker and physician Delaney Rustin. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. So what made you decide to do this documentary? Oh, I was really struggling as a mom. I had a teenager girl who wanted more social media and a boy who wanted more video games. And I wanted to know as a physician the impact of all this screen time. But really as a mom, I really wanted to know what to do. So that's why I made the film. So uh, what is the impact? What does the scientific research show? Yeah. Well, I think there's evidence about this can affect empathy. Development of empathy really depends on reading social cues. And the science shows that when they take away devices, kids actually perform better on studies that look at their ability to look at these social cues. So that makes me concerned. What about effects on um, learning and memory? Mm -hmm. Has there been research done on that as well? Well, we have some data that's just come out about mice. And when they take young mice and they put them in a room with flashing lights and sounds to mimic the screen time of kids, what's amazing is that the part of the brain that's responsible for learning and memory does not develop the same number of neurons as a baby mice that wasn't exposed to these. Hmm. And the effect is ultimately permanent, and it's concerning. We obviously can't do the same kind of experiments on kids, but it's just to note that this is a developmental time that we're giving kids excessive, often excessive screen time. And so we did a poll on Twitter because mm -hmm. this is an issue that so many parents face, right? And we asked parents, do you limit your kid's screen time? 44% uh, said yes, strictly. 38% uh, said they try to. And 18% said no, we do not police it. Mm -hmm. What should parents do? Well, absolutely, what's needed is so hard to do, but actually to have some concrete guidelines. And the way that we're going to help kids to develop self-control is actually to have rules. It seems kind of contraindic, you know, it doesn't make sense. You kind of think they should just do this on their own. It's hard, though, to decide what to do, and it comes from conversations with kids, getting their input. And so I'll give you an example. For us, for example, we don't use our cell phones when we're driving in the car. We talk. We don't use them at the dinner table, and we don't use them in the bedrooms at night. But you know what's really interesting? Making this documentary, I learned that parenting is so private. People would tell me all the time, you know, I'm having all these problems. And I would say, well, what kind of solutions are you trying? And people would be really hesitant to say. They felt really judged. And that's why, you know, it's so important that we're having these type of talks about what we can do. Just to let parents know that there are many other parents facing mm -hmm. the same issue. Oh, gosh, and yeah. if we can work together, maybe some solutions can come mm -hmm. out that all parents uh, can find a way to negotiate them yeah. into their homes. We also went to Facebook and mm -hmm. asked you know, parents what they do about limiting their uh, kids' screen time. Uh, Elizabeth Berg said she never worried about it much. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem to have much of an impact. Her son ended up getting a degree in aerospace engineering. Mm -hmm. um, another woman said her son is now at UC Berkeley and on a full scholarship, even though she never limited screen time. But of course, there were other parents who, you know, said the opposite, that they, they don't have cable, they don't have DVDs, mm -hmm. they do games and crafts with their kids, and it doesn't become an issue. Um, is there a, a middle ground mm -hmm. here? Well, you know, in Screenagers, one of my favorite stories that the film looks at is a young girl 
who really wanted, she was in eighth grade, social media. And when she couldn't have it, she ended up sneaking it. And when some social cruelty did happen, she was so devastated that she couldn't go to her mom. Mm. So the key thing really is deciding within the family what seems reasonable, but making sure that there are guidelines. And you know, it's writing them down, but being flexible and having weekly conversations. So many, I don't know how often this happens to you, but it's grabbing the device in the moment, yeah. and it's just being reactionary and angry. And setting up this cat and mouse thing isn't good at all for helping kids to navigate this. And so these, weekly conversations at on our website screenagersmovie.com we really foster this well i have a nine-year-old yeah. so this is definitely an issue an ongoing issue for us in the car yeah. at home in the bedroom um, parents though are they setting a mm -hmm. bad example as well because they're constantly checking their phones many of them oh gosh you don't, there's so many parents that talked to me when i was making the film i feel so guilty because i know i should be modeling well and i'm not and I said, well, what are your personal guidelines? Because you can never you know, reach a goal if you don't have them. And they go, I don't really have it. My goal is just to do it less. Mm. And as a physician, I know behavior change never works that way. So ultimately, I talk to parents about setting one or two goals and talking to their kids about what they're trying to get better at. Maybe they've been texting at the dinner table and they know that that's not really healthy for their communication with their kids. So now that the film is out, you've been mm -hmm. showing it to uh, a lot of schools, and also yeah. to companies, uh, Pixar, for mm -hmm. example. What would you like to see happen next? Oh, well, for me, it's all about getting parents and kids and educators together because this is the biggest parenting issue of our time. It's not just like a, f a psychological issue. This is physiologic. And kids want this screen time so much. So we have to get the schools, the kids, and the parents to talk about how we're gonna help them find balance. And so that's why our film is all about showing in the community so people come together. And the goal is a lot of conversations, weekly conversations rather than this angry cat and mouse. All right, all good advice, Dr. Delaney Rustin. Thank you, and thank you for the documentary. Thank you so much. This week, we want to turn our attention to three law enforcement stories around the Bay Area. In San Francisco, more questions surfaced about the recent police shooting of Luis Gangara. Sydney Spiegel said she often saw Gangara, a homeless man, fixing bikes on Shotwell Street. Uh, Luis, the person who was killed, I've never seen him behave violently. Um, all that I know from him is that he was friends with the other uh, kind of residers on this block and that he fixed people's bikes and that was it and the, the other people really liked him and they were they were grieving over him. In Santa Clara County, supervisors accepted sweeping recommendations to reform the county jail and heard a call to take control of the jail from the sheriff. This comes as deaths at the jail are still being investigated, plus racial bias in traffic stops, new data on a long-standing issue. Joining me now to discuss these stories are KQED reporter Alex Emsley, KQED Silicon Valley desk reporter Beth Willon, and San Francisco Chronicle reporter Joaquin Palomino. Welcome to you all. Alex, wanted to start with you. Uh, the Luis Gancora shooting was the first in San Francisco, the first fatal shooting um, since the Mario Woods incident late last year. It happens amid a lot of um, calls for change in the way that the uh, SFPD handles uh, force issues. Did officers adhere to policy in this case? There's a lot of criticism of that. The San Francisco Chronicle um, late last week published some surveillance video of this shooting where you can tell it takes approximately 22 seconds from the first command an officer gives to the final fatal shot um, of Luis Gongora and this seems to fly in the, in the face of uh, long-standing SFPD policies, which are, of course, in the process of being redrafted. But still, for about at least three years now, officers have been being told and reminded again that when someone is not a danger to anyone else, either a police officer or another civilian, to foster time and distance and allow for some uh, de-escalation to occur before sort of um, rushing in and maybe creating a situation that turns deadly that may otherwise not have to. So 22 seconds uh, does not seem to indicate that time and distance was really afforded in this situation. 
Now, of course, you could, I mean, you can look at the other side of that, and of course, I mean, uh, law enforcement officials have said also that these events can tend to unfold really quickly. So then it kind of becomes a question of policy, where is the policy followed, but also who created a situation that didn't allow for that time and distance to happen. I've heard some of the strongest language um, uh, around that um, that I've ever heard from both the chief of police and police commissioners in San Francisco questioning, what do we have to do to make it stick that you're not to charge suspects who only have an edged weapon and aren't necessarily a danger to anyone else? You have to stay back. What has been the political fallout to Greg Sir? Well, I mean, Greg Sir has been very, um, the one one thing that he always does is he makes himself very available to criticism. He always holds a town hall meeting shortly after these shootings and hears from anyone with issues in the community. Um, those town hall meetings have gotten um, more and more strained as people sort of trust less the things that he says as these investigations develop in previous officer-involved shootings. And some of the things that he's said have turned not to necessarily be borne out by evidence. Um, there's a lot of anger at the chief of police in San Francisco right now, but um, he also has good relationships in the city and uh, some things like uh, a three-year-old bulletin on creating time and distance that he can point to and say, look, I'm trying to change this mentality in the police department. He doesn't get, only, get, he doesn't get a lot of credit for that, but it is things that he does as well as some of the um, other things such as selective uh, uh, release of witness statements that's drawn a lot of criticism in the Gongoro shooting. And so you believe then that sort of the response, the community response is sort of getting more and more you know, frustrated or angry uh, to these officer involved shootings? I think, yeah, I mean, w w it shouldn't be lost that each one of these incidents are incredibly serious. I mean, we're talking about loss of life and at the hands of, you know, a law enforcement officer. So they're always going to be emotional, I think. But yes, I think that with each one that happens, there is a growing amount of anger and a growing call for uh, the police department and the civilian leaders over it to do whatever they can to reduce them. So, um, and you pointed out that each of these uh, cases is very serious. It involves a death and use of force. Um, but at the heart of it is also issues of public trust um, and community faith in the police department. And that uh, is also at the heart of a story that you reported on, Joaquin. Uh, it had to do with racial disparities in the way that San Francisco conducts its traffic stops, uh, especially um, including consent searches. What is a consent search and what did you find there? Mm -hmm. So uh, a consent search is when an officer asks a driver permission to search their car. Um, it's rarely used in San Francisco, but uh, it's really controversial. I mean, a lot of legal experts, civil liberties groups sort of criticize it because, you know, unlike a search based on probable cause or a reasonable suspicion where a cop has to actually point to evidence that, hey, I, I saw what appears to be, you know, some fruits of a crime, a consent search can just be based on, you know, a cop's hunch. Um, and sometimes people don't even know they can decline a consent search and say no. Yeah, there's there's some debate over whether or not, yeah, uh, people, you know, hear a, a cop's question, you know, can I search your car as a question versus a command. Um, so what was the racial disparity that you uncovered there? So looking at about three years of data on traffic stops in San Francisco, traffic stops and searches, um, I found that African Americans were about eight times more likely to be asked permission to search their vehicle after, after a stop uh, than white drivers. And Latino drivers were about four times more likely than white drivers uh, to be asked permission to search their vehicles. Does that add up considering what the demographics are? No, it doesn't. Um, it was about 50% of all consent searches were of African American drivers. The population of San Francisco, I mean, the black population in San Francisco is about 6%. Um, so really disproportionate, this, this type of search is disproportionately used on you know, Latinos and African American drivers. And we, we know about disproportionality in sort of the criminal justice system written broadly, but I just wonder, I mean, how big of an outlier is San Francisco in these compared to maybe disparities in other jurisdictions? So yeah, I mean, there's been tons of research on traffic stops because it, traffic stop data, because it is sort of the most common interaction between police and the public. Um, and similar disparities have been found in, in other jurisdictions. I think what sets San Francisco apart, at least speaking with, you know, district attorney and, and other, other experts and activists here, um, is that there's this sense that San Francisco is different, that, you know, as a progressive sort of bastion, we don't have these same issues with, you know, potential bias in policing. Uh, but 
you know, as, as your story pointed out, and as sort of all these incidents suggest, you know, th there may be some, you know, implicit bias within SFPD as well. Well, how much influence do social factors have on the data possibly? Uh, for example, higher crime rates in certain communities or frequent police patrols in minority communities? Yes, yeah, so social factors play a big role in traffic stop data and, and no one can really, you know, parse out how big of a role, you know, police patrols in predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods play in, in, in stop and search rates versus what may be, you know, implicit bias or something else. Um, and that's what, when I spoke to SFP, what they were saying is, you know, crime is concentrated, you know, unfortunately in, in African American Latino neighborhoods, they send cops there, cops stop people, they search people uh, at higher rates. There was one other sort of uh, metric that I, that I looked at, mm -hmm. which was the evidence recovery rate, which is also called a hit rate. Mm -hmm. And that's following discretionary search, so a search where a cop decides, I'm gonna search this person. Right. Um, and the evidence recovery rate for African Americans and to a lesser extent Latinos was much, much lower than whites and Asians. Has the chief of police or other high-ranking officials in the San Francisco Police Department responded to your story and did they talk to you for this? Uh, the chief of police was not made available for the story. I did mm. speak to a commander um, of the traffic division. And what did he have to say? She... Oh, she, I should say. Yeah. How how presumptuous <laughs> she uh, I mean she attributed the disparities largely to social mm. factors but also they said they were going to accept I, I gave them all my findings before I published anything okay and they said they're gonna look into it also want to talk about uh, an ongoing law enforcement issue in Santa Clara County as well Beth and um, this week a blue ribbon commission this was one that was formed after the um, death of mentally ill inmate Ty uh, Michael Tyree this week, the commission presented its findings to the rec to the Board of Supervisors, 100 recommendations. What are some of the top ones? Well, the top two recommendations that the commission wants approved in fast order are, first of all, they want to take control of the jails away from Sheriff Lori Smith. Secondly, they want to open an office of inspector general who would be a watchdog of sorts, who would have oversight over the jails, but would not control the jails. Now, taking the jails away from Lori Smith is going to be problematic and it's going to be a long grueling process because for starters there's a contract with the sheriff that the county has there's a county ch uh, charter and there's also constitutional issues state constitutional issues on whether or not they have the authority to do this it's extremely political also some call it a political landmine because you've got a body of elected officials the board of supervisors who are trying to take something away from another elected official it's an election year and you throw in the union unions in this and it gets very, very dicey. Thirdly, there is a long and sordid, somewhat torturous history to this because there was a Department of Corrections in the 1980s that ran the jails. That was problematic. It was costly. And for budget reasons and, and many other reasons, they turned everything over to the sheriff. So, so how is, often can you keep repacking that is, is a question. Yeah. And then what is the sheriff's response to all this, the recommendations and also the suggestion that the jail be removed from her control? Well, I talked to her after the recommendations were made, and she is said that she has in full support of having oversight, uh, an office of an inspector general. And she said, as a matter of fact, that she was, she recommended that in some of her sweeping reforms. As far as taking the jails away from her, she said, let's wait until all the studies are in. This week, uh, uh, next week rather, uh, a big study is going to be coming out from the National Institute of Corrections, and they did an independent evaluation of, of the jail system. So the, um Retired Superior Court Judge LaDoris Cordell, she chaired the commission. Yeah. This week, she, before the Board of Supervisors, she compared Sheriff Smith to a pilot who was, quote, either indifferent or incompetent during a plane's long descent uh, toward crashing. Is the commission or any of the supervisors calling on Sheriff Smith to step down? Well, despite the fact that it was a scorched earth presentation of the recommendations, they are not asking her to step down or they're not trying to remove her. They've stopped short of that. And they're simply, it, it's not simply, but they're asking to remove control of the jails from her. So at this point, nobody is asking for that. And to her credit, to Sheriff Lori Smith's credit, she has been proposing these reforms. She wants to work with them as much as possible. She made that clear afterwards. And also, she's not tried to cover anything up since the Michael Tyree incident. She opened the department 
up. What's going to be most problematic for her to a large degree, I think, is that there were 300 complaints filed by inmates of use of force since 2010. Only 14 of them were investigated and five of them had definitive action. That raises a lot of questions because why were these stopped at the front end? Were people being protected? Yeah. Was the department being protected because of the optics of this? Lots so of just real quickly, she's up for re-election in 2018. Do you think she'll weather this storm this time around? Well, she, she said that I'm not a quitter. I want to see the reforms go through. And she said, I haven't started to raise money yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if she ran again. She survived mm. some blistering campaigns in the past. but oh, And she's uh, been sheriff for nearly 20 years. So. Yes, she has. All right, we will see. Beth, thank you. You're welcome. Beth Willon, uh, Joaquin Palomino, and Alex Emsley, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thanks. The sporting world was fixed on the Bay Area this week. On Wednesday, the Golden State Warriors jumped to the top of the NBA's history books with a record-setting 73rd win of the season. And now the Warriors will set up for its next challenge, a repeat championship win. For more on the seemingly unstoppable team, we're joined by veteran Bay Area sports journalist Matt Steinmetz. Matt, pleasure to have you here. Thanks. Well, boy, have you seen a lot of changes over the years. You've been covering the Warriors for 20 years from the time when they were doormats of the NBA. Yep. Now they're at the top of the league. Even non-basketball fans are now fans of the team. What is it like for you to see the Bay Area swept up in Warriors fever like this? Well, it's incredible, especially when you compare it to the way the team was 20 years ago. I mean, this was a team that went through a stretch one time of 12 straight years without making the playoffs. And Warrior fans were just accustomed to the team losing year after year after year. And then in 2007, they made the playoffs with the We Believe team, which got some acclaim, obviously, in the Bay Area. But then even after that, the team went downhill so if you're a longtime warrior fan you're kind of conditioned for something to go wrong so i always <laughs> joke that longtime warrior fans uh, are waiting for something to go wrong and they can't quite appreciate this but the young the young people out there uh, who don't know about the warriors history they are just on cloud nine right now and the bay area has just been buzzing about this team yeah. for two years what now. a wonderful moment what is it about this team that you think allows it to keep on shattering records 73 wins steph curry surpassed the 400 mark for three-pointers. He's now at a total of 402. I mean, it's amazing. It's crazy. The numbers have been unbelievable. I think Steph Curry is where you have to start. Uh, he's the perfect kind of leader for a team. He is the best player on the team. But I think what's most important about him is he's a very inclusive person. And players, his teammates gravitate toward him. Not just Clay Thompson and Draymond Green, who are the better players on the team, but also the guys uh, at the end of the bench. And that chemistry that I think he fosters goes a long way toward why they're such a good team. The NBA, for a long time, is built on having one superstar, and basically you give the ball to that guy, and he makes all the plays. The Warriors are very different uh, in that respect. Curry, how, much is, how much is that uh, Steve Kerr's doing as well? It, it has a lot to do with Steve Kerr because he was a player under Greg Popovich, who's considered one of the best coaches ever, and Greg Popovich is big on having five guys touch the ball. Mm -hmm and passing's most important, not a player who can score. And so even though Curry's the best player on the team, everybody has a role on the team, one through 12. And so uh, they're just, they really have great camaraderie. And yeah. I think that's what they're riding to a lot of success. You've watched uh, Curry practice. Is he human? I mean, I watched, a, I, I read a Washington Post article on him and it seems like any ball he touches, not just a basketball, he has a great intuition for the ball. Yeah, he's, he's a natural athlete. Uh, he golfs, he's a scratch golfer. Um, he's obviously a great basketball player. He uses innovative techniques to uh, improve his game, his ball handling. When he came into the league, his ball handling was something that many thought he needed to work on. Well, here it is seven years later, and a lot of people think he's the best ball handler in the league. He seems to have that thing on a string. Uh, so, you know, he's just been remarkable in terms of he has improved every year he's been in the league, yeah. and not many pros can say that. Um, you know, Wednesday's game was historic for Coach Kerr as well. He um, 
the, the record that they broke was previously set yeah. by the Bulls team that he was on yeah. back in 95-96. What was that victory like for him? He said it was a little bit bittersweet, and it, it's funny because he's very self-effacing, and he was talking about how if he wanted to, he could sabotage the team so they wouldn't <laughs> touch his record. Um, but as they got closer to the record, what he did was – he asked the team what they wanted to do, if they wanted to go for it uh, and spend a lot of time and energy trying to get to 73 wins. And they said, let's go for it. And so he, Forever. he al uh, allowed them to pursue that path. Problem. That's another reason why I think Steve Kerr is a special guy is because he puts all the responsibility in the players' hands and they respond well to it because yeah. they're mature. Well, it's fantastic that they broke the record, but on the other hand, does that also set up a whole new set of pressures now for them to win the championship? Because, yeah. boy, you reached that 73rd win mark. You better do it now. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, there's comparisons being made to the New England Patriots, who they went 18-0 and and then lost in the Super Bowl. Uh, there's no doubt if the Warriors don't win the NBA title, this is going to be a very disappointing season as great as it seemingly is right now. But when you're the defending champions, the, def the, the championship and winning it again is the most important thing. And this team, like I said, they're smart, they're mature. And so I think they're really good at putting that part of the season behind them and now heading toward the playoffs where they're going to hope to repeat. Um, if the championship, if they win it, would you go so far as to say that this is the single greatest NBA season ever? Uh, yeah, I would really? go. I would go that far to say it's the greatest season ever. It's a good thing you didn't say team, uh, yeah. because then I'd have to think about some other teams. But yeah, you can't argue with it. 73 wins, nobody's ever done it. And if they win a title, uh, this two-year run for the Warriors is yeah. unprecedented. It really is. First playoff game this weekend. Want to venture a prediction as to how it's going to end? Easy. The Warriors will win. <laughs> and as long as I don't have to get more specific than that, I'm probably safe. You know. All right. Well, we'll hold you to that. <laughs> but it's a good prediction, I must say. Thanks. Matt Steinmetz with 95.7 The Game. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And that is it for tonight. I'm Sui Vu. Thanks so much for watching. For all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org.